Hey there, guy. You having a nice, uh, having a nice little uh, sunbath over there? You know, I like to do that sometimes. You know, I put a nice little speedo on, hang out in the backyard. You know, on a concrete backyard in a plastic lawn chair. In a near west suburb, maybe Berwyn, you know, maybe Oak Park, you know. I do that, but one time I did it and the neighbors called the cops on me. I guess because I didn't shave my bush. They were mad or something. They didn't want to see me out there. What you doing? Oh, you look pretty comfortable. All right. Oh, that's a nice tail you got. Oh, about two feet long. All right. Ah, there we go. Anyway, on the uh, over a billion years old, this granite here, this granite substrate, this felsic intrusive igneous rock. Oh, look at those nice waves out there. Oh, it looks like some good surfing. Rather abrasive coastline here, too. I guess it's pretty easy to die. You get rip currents. It's rather steep. You know, it's, uh, it's much, uh, much like uh, the coast of Northern California. Hey, you don't need to be concerned about what I'm doing. I'm not trying to come over there and mess with you. I'm over here. I'm looking at stuff, okay? I'm just, uh, you know, I have every right to be here as much as you do. I don't know why you're acting so offended that I'm here, huh? I'm looking at this. Anyway, here we go. Conostylus juncia. Hemodoraceae. Kangaroo paw, paw family. Remember that's the Nigoxanthos? The really wild looking one with the, the bright colors. A Nigoxanthos is a real nice genus. They call them the kangaroo paws. Real fuzzy. Is the all, all, they believe all the flowers in this family are pretty fuzzy too. Get up there, you can see how fuzzy that one is. Conostylus has a lot of diversity in it too. A lot of species here. Look at these, uh, look at these leaves though, too. Almost bromeliad like with those teeth on the margins, those little spines on the margins. Oh, that's pretty nice. Growing on the granite, growing on the granite soils with a little bit of broken glass and a, a handful of weeds. Oh, yeah, so the coastline's mostly Melaleuca. It's a species of Melaleuca. Got a rather abrasive uh, coast, dude. The waves just keep crashing. You can easily get swept off. Look at how beautiful this granite is, though. One billion year old rock. It's between, I don't know, about one and 1 1.5 billion years, I believe. Like most of the rocks in Australia, it's very old. And you got this little canescent bastard everywhere. Probably either a species of Asteraceae or uh, Amaranthaceae. The Kinopoid subfamily, of course. Oh, it's quite, quite the, quite the scenery here, but, but uh, not many plants. Oh, some nice porphyry here. Very phaneritic. It's so phaneritic of you. Look at how big those grains are. Very coarse grained. Illustrious pink granite. Oh, do you think touch? Just touch it. Just give it a nice feel. Just rub it down nice. Look at the way it erodes too. It's much uh, much smoother than rhyolite or volcanics. You know when it gets to work on by a, a billion years of, uh, well, it hasn't been exposed for a billion years. Who knows when it was uplifted. But it's had some time to get weathered, you know, by the ocean, by the rain, etc. Oh, yeah, the wind, too. Don't forget that. So here's a nice member of the citrus family, Rutaceae. It's got those uh, pellucid oil glands, remember. The whole family's got those pellucid oil glands. I mean, maybe not the whole, but most of them. Pellucid oil glands, the resin glands. That's why if you, you take this foliage and crush it up, it's got a very uh, pungent scent to it, you know? Almost smells kind of bad, but some like it nasty, you know. Maybe somebody, maybe, maybe some people like it, you know. I kind of like it. I wonder if the kangaroo's not on it. Probably not. Seems like it'd be a discouragement to herbivory to me, but uh, but who knows? Damn, those my Montana is a member of the citrus family that we get in uh, North American deserts. It's called turpentine broom. It's because it stinks. It's got a very pungent smell again due to those pellucid oil glands. How pellucid are you feeling today? You feeling pretty pellucid? I'm feeling pretty pellucid. Anyway, look at these flowers. 
four petals. Kind of a beautiful genus, huh? It's quite. A, I've seen quite a few uh, baronias. Look at look at how the buds look before the petals open too. Those are the petals right there. That's not the calyx. The calyx is this little, this little tiny, little tiny spikes right there. Or are those just bricks? I don't know. You gotta watch out. Some flowers the some flowers lack petals. Some flowers lack sepals. Real beautiful bastard though. Look at that. Baronia, citrus family, rutaceae. Anyway, so most of the dominant tree here that you could see over there is this. It's the species of Melaleuca, which is the same genus the tea tree is in, Myrtaceae, of course. Melaleuca is a rather large genus in the family Myrtaceae, same family as Guava and Eucalypts, same subfamily as Eucalypts. That's because it's got those woody capsule fruits. See those? Each one of those was a flower. Anyway, you know, it's common, but it's a pretty interesting, uh, pretty interesting genus. Again, a lot of speciation in it down here. Myrtaceae is the family, one of the dominant plant families you see in uh, the region, along with Proteaceae, Asteraceae, Fabaceae, etc. But at least among trees, it's mostly Proteaceae and Myrtaceae. Yeah, so speaking of Myrtaceae, here's Agonis flexuosus. Agonis, Agonis, it doesn't matter. You bust my balls about how you pronounce stuff. It really doesn't matter. It's a, Latin's a dead language. I'll hear friends of mine in Mexico say, gen, they come up with wacky-ass names to say the name of a genus. It doesn't matter. I still know what they're talking about, you know? Anyway, the, point, the important point to uh, pay attention to here is uh, you get those five distinct petals. And then, of course, like most of them are tacea, you got the uh, stamens occurring in a ring around at the central disc. And inside that central disc is the female part. You can't really see it. Oh, there, you, there you go. There you get some light on there. But uh, the leaves almost look like a eucalypt. They're these really uh, linear uh, lanceolate. Well, it's not lanceolate. It's just linear it would be. <clears throat> I guess you could call it lanceolate. Yeah, it's more swollen at the base than the tip. And then over here you got uh, another important member of the proteaceae. This is Banksia sessilis. And a lot of them look like they're getting blasted. I don't know what that's from. If they got Phytophthora, they got that... Uh, yeah, it's a relative of Irish potato blight. It's technically not a fungus. It's technically a brown algae that became parasitic, uh, Phytophthora. But it's uh, it's really knocking out a lot of stuff over here. There you go, Banksia sessilis, holly leaved. Very very uh, painful. <laughs> very painful. There's some uh, brushing up against me right now, and it uh, I'll say it's stabbing me and it hurts. But yeah, see they got they got some. Uh, Something's going on with the leaves. I've seen a couple dead ones down there, too. So these, there you go. You can see nice proteoid flower. Those are the styles poking out. And the tepals, which look just like the styles, those little white hairy things at the bottom, have recurved back uh, to let those styles out and do their thing. The styles, of course, present the pollen first. And then the second stage, they, uh, they take in uh, the receptive to pollen. See, here's some that haven't opened yet. See, so these these are tepals. These aren't styles yet. Those tepals will open up. Those tubes will open up. You can already see them doing it down there. Such pointy teeth. You know, there you go, Banksia sessilis. Speaking of proteaceae, here's a proteoid that's trying to look like it's in the myrtle family. Pretty interesting. Smells pretty good, though. This is uh, probably a hachia, possibly a grevillea. But you can get up close, you can see those are proteoid flowers. And certainly right there you see those nice woody fruits. Look at that. How's that? Little umbos, little devil horns on that woody fruit. Woody capsule. So like I said, I'm guessing hachia, possibly grevillea. Have to figure this one out. Well, look at it. I mean, just from far back, it looks like a, like a Myrtaceae. Looks like a Myrtle family, huh? You devious bastard, you're lying, huh? No, I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. You're, you're, you're beautiful. I'm just like, just joking around. Everybody gets so sensitive these days. I don't know. You can't joke anymore. You can't fuck around, you know? I mean, you can, but you're going to piss people off. But I guess that's half the fun. Look, I love those little things. Look at them. Look at that. Look at those little fruits. See, I broke his horn off by accident when I was fondling him. Maybe he'll forget.
Hey, look at it. See, he's just, he's still got last year's fruits on him. Just waiting for a fire to come true. You know, and then, of course, you got your Banksy Assessless up there. And again, growing in that uh, phosphorus lacking sandy soil, you got to have the proteoid roots. You got to have those proteoid cluster roots. You know, and they release the carboxylates, I guess, in two or three day bursts, not not throughout the entire growing season. They release them all at once in two or three day bursts, you know, so they can just quickly suck up that phosphorus and then uh, and then they stop uh, stop putting it out there. If they released it throughout the whole growing season and make phosphorus available to other plants, other plants would gank it from them, punk them out of it, and then of course you get the microbes in the soil coming for the carboxylase and the phosphorus too. He goes, smells great. Great smelling plant. And look at those leaves. Entire margins. Minutely hairy. Get a nice money shot of the fruits again. Oh, look at it. Look at those woody fruits. You see, I told you the Banksia Cessalus was dying. Okay, here we go. No, running with the theme here of uh, persistent wildfires. Look at that. See, those woody fruits is a species of calitris. It's in the redwood family, Cupressaceae. Redwood and juniper family. Uh, pretty uh, pretty convergent here with our California cypresses. But you can look up, you know, see, those cones don't open without fire. Those are probably, those probably been on there six or seven years at least, maybe a little bit longer. And they're not going to open until either this plant dies or that branch gets cut or a fire comes through and melts the resin that's holding those cone scales together, at which point they dump out all 40 or 50 at a season site. You know, wildfires are part of this landscape. There's just, uh, there's no escaping. You could build as many rich homes, uh, you know, uh, here if you, thank God they're not doing that, but they are in Southern California. And you can build as many rich homes as you want, pretend the fire's never going to come through, and then you can stop it, but there's no stopping it. It's going to happen eventually. Look, here's that uh, casita again. That uh, parasite in the avocado family. How about that? Again, convergent with our uh, United States daughter, Cuscuta species. No relation at all, just doing the same thing. You know, stealing its food from other plants and uh, taking on the same form as the, uh, as the daughter. How about that? That's nice, huh? And over here you got a species of clematis. You weren't expecting to see the genus clematis down here in Australia, huh? Yet there it is. I, you know, I don't have much to say about it. I'm not too enthralled by clematis. I like them, but I'm just not, there's not much, you know, what are you going to say about them? I don't know what to say about them. They're pretty, I like them. Look at how they look. Look, there's one with the, with the petals that fall off. That fell off right there. Yeah, anyway, there you go, clematis. And so right here on the side of the road, we're graced with another woody shrub, another proteaceae, obviously. Get up close and look at those leaves. You can see then they don't actually feel like leaves at all. There's nothing delicate and soft about these. These are very spiny. It kind of feels like a wire broom. And get up close and look at the flowers. Oh, that's nice. See, look, look at it. Those four valvate tepals pulled back. Proteas are just a... a goddamn remarkable family there's so much variation ancient lineage you know we're talking 90 million years old probably a lot older than it you know and just look at that look at that prominent yellow that's got it that's just the style poking out they're kind of swollen uh and of course the uh the teeples here are fuzzy they got some they're a little hairy they got some you know little pubescence on them Here's the woody, woody base. And of course, if you were to dig down, you'd find the proteoid roots, proteoid cluster roots. So you got Banksia grandis, you got some Xanthoria, the grass tree, AKA, and then a Carimbia. Oh, a rather large grass tree up there. Look at that, Xanthoria. And then over here, you got the Caledonia latifolia, one of the pink fairy orchids. Just growing on the sand, growing on a nice sandy soil. Again, one a uh, hairy basil leaf. And then, of course, there's one of the 9,000 species of Fabaceae that I can't identify that all look the same. Uh, so, you know, when you go behind a gas station and take a leak, because the bathroom, so uh, there's got a big long line in front of it, and there's too many people out there. And then, so you go. You go behind a gas station to take a leak and you realize that, you know, someone already took a dump back there, just on the ground. Didn't even bury it, just kind of smells like hell. Uh, that's what 
uh, this species in the stinkhorn family, Fallacia, smells like right now. It felt, it smells like someone just took a big old dump uh, right on the ground. I mean, it is, it's amazing how much uh, this uh, mushroom smells like human feces. You know, when I've seen them before, they've smelled like uh, maybe rotting eggs or, or perhaps uh, you know, rotting meat. Got a little carrion thing going on, but uh, you could definitely uh, see it's attracting flies, which then of course disperse the spores. For it. It's a pretty ingenious uh, mechanism here, and it seems to be working for him. Again, just uh, popping out right out the sand. And uh, I'd assume, and this is, unless this is another amazing case of convergent evolution, that this is in the stinkhorn family Phalaceae. One of the prominent, prominent genera in that uh, family of mushrooms is the genus Phallus. That is amazing. It's, it smells terrible. I've smelled many a home bum patty, you know. Especially living in a city near San Francisco, you've smelled many a third. You know, the Bay Area is famous for, a, you know, metropolitan, uh, metropolitan shitting. I just, I want to get close, but it smells so bad. Eh, fuck it, whatever, here we go. Look at that. Yeah, pretty remarkable. Life will find a way to encourage shit flies to transport your spores for you. There you go. Oh, so this beautiful red bastard is a species in the genus Kennedya, which is in the Fabaceae, the pea family, of course, and this is certainly one of the beans. It's in the Faboidae subfamily. Growing right in the grass tree in a Xanthoria. And it is a Xanthoria, snap it. Yeah, there you go. Xanthorias tend to be a lot wider than Kingia as well. They do look uh, amazingly alike, but Kennedya tends to be taller and narrower. It doesn't branch. You can see the Xanthoria, at least that one's branching. <clears throat> and again, the foliage on the Xanthoria snaps pretty easily. So let's uh, look at this Kennedya though. Kennedya. Somebody was busting my balls about pronunciation. It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. You know, now I'm all self-conscious about it. You like that? Now I'm, I'm a little self-conscious. Not too self-conscious, you know. Not uh, not so self-conscious that I still wouldn't go outside in a thong with a huge Italian bikini bush. But, you know, I'm a little self-conscious. Look at those flowers, though. Like all the goddamn Fabaceae's out here, you just got amazing colors. Look at the colorations on those. And again, you got trifolia leaves on these. Uh, which, you know, I haven't seen many trifolia leaves on any of the pea families out here. Any of the Fabaceae's. You know, I've seen some weird ass leaves, but uh, this is this is the first time I've actually seen something that looks rough, you know, roughly northern hemisphere, northern hemisphere looking. Most of the pea family down here, most of the Fabaceae, aside from the flowers, they don't look uh, they don't look like anything we see in the northern hemisphere. You know, the the colors are a lot brighter. The flowers look papillinaceous. They got the banner wings and keel, but they're just a lot. <laughs> they're just it's really it's, it is it's like drinking cough syrup and going out botanizing you just you feel like something's off speaking of cough syrup you ever do that thing where you know you're sick and you got to take some because you can't sleep without it you got a cough and a sore throat and they give you a little you know measuring cup you figure fuck it i'm an adult i don't need to uh, to measure my dosage of uh, robitussin so then you just slam the bottle and you end up uh, wet in the bed later because you apparently drank too much and you can't hold your uh your cough syrup late at night? <laughs> yeah, me neither. I was just curious if that had ever happened to you. Anyway, here's a species of Drosera. Again, I think you got like a close to, I don't know, 200, 300 species in Australia of this wonderful carnivorous plant genus. This one's in flower. Five uh, prominent, prominent anthers. Somewhat pendant flowers until they open. And then, of course, just the, all those little modified leaves with the glands and a sticky juice for the bugs. The sticky juice and then the enzymes that just take the bugs apart and that's how they get their nitrogen because again, the soil is this nutrient the deficient sand. Oh look, it's another species of Stylidium. This one with quite a different uh, leaf texture. Waxy leaf texture. Almost looks kind of like it's got a candelabra thing going on. 
How many different species of stylidium are there? A couple hundred? Holy shit. Stylidiaceae. The trigger plants. You know, I'm pretty into them. I'm pretty into them. They do their thing pretty well. Got a couple different kinds. A couple different kinds of stylidium over there. What's this? Looks senesioid. Oh, look at that. It's the Stackhousia. Stackhousiaceae. Almost an entirely Australian family, except for, I believe, one species. Goes into Melanesia. And then over here, you got a nice Pimalaya. Looks like uh, probably Pimalaya ferruginea. But look at those, like, look, glassy, glassy uh, leaves, glossy leaves. Almost imbricate. Oval leaves and shit. And then of course just a cluster of a bunch of four petaled flowers. Thymelilaceae. Thymeliaceae. <laughs> it's a fucking... That family name's got too many vowels in it. It's kind of confusing. They kind of overdid it on that one. Oh, look from the, look from the side view. Ah, oh, that's pretty nice. Look at that. Yeah, that's good. Okay, that's good. All right. Okay, here's another member of the Fabaceae, of course. And this one's pretty interesting. Yeah, you know, it just looks like a kind of normal, uh, normal papillinaceous flower. You got the big, big ass banner, that back yellow petal, the wings, uh, the, the red lower petals, which are, of course, enclosing the queue. You got kind of these uh, spatulate leaves, kind of heart shaped up top. But the interesting thing about this one is you got these kind of rat fink crackhead eyeballs uh, on the back of the petal. Doesn't it look like the uh, little bloodshot, uh, you know, the crackhead uh, rat fink eyes? Doesn't it look like it? Oh, that, that, that does. It does kind of look like that. Do you like how I can just take the most beautiful things and still bring a ugly, nasty, urban, gritty feel to them? You know, everything talking about home bum patties behind dumpsters, uh, uh, crackhead eyeballs, etc., Tweakers, uh, crime, robber, whatever. Anyway, yeah, beautiful plant, though. Isotropus cuneifolia. Just growing on the sandy plains. The sandy plains. A hey, curious species of acacia. You know, you got your little pom-pom fruits. See the little pom-pom fruits? Mimosoid flowers. Again, Fabaceae P family. But look at the leaves here. Or I guess more more specifically, they're, they're probably cladodes. They're probably not true uh, true leaves. Maybe they are. I don't know, but a lot of the a lot of the acacias down here get cladodes. They get those uh, basically just photosynthetic stems. It's not true leaf tissue. Regardless, it's pretty goddamn weird. And then of course here are the fruits. Even the fruits. Oh yeah, they got some. There's some thorns on those. It feels pretty. Uh, Jesus Christ. It's not delicate at all. Again, that foliage is not delicate at all. It's quite stiff. There's the fruits. The developing legumes, very somewhat inconspicuous. This whole, uh, the whole genus, remember, the whole genus is endemic to a ca to uh, Australia now. The whole genus acacia, you know, ever since everything got recircumscribed, not recircumcised. How do you get recircumcised? Could you do that? I don't know. Oh, oh, it smells pretty good though. It does. It smells pretty good. Probably a really important nectar source here. And just armored leaves, a.k.a. cladodes, not true leaves. Anyway, this is kind of a lousy specimen because it's covered in road dust. But here's an orchid, another terrestrial orchid, colloquially known as the donkey orchid in the genus Diaris. It's got, got quite an interesting uh, variation on what it's doing with its, uh, with its petals right there. There's one that's open. Get up, you could look at that labellum. Pretty nice. Large tepals, a big hood. Lower labellum, and of course those two lower tepals are just uh, extremely elongated. There's a the little basal leaf. Oh, it's got two basal leaves. How about that? 
These would just look like a blade of grass if you couldn't, uh, if you didn't see the flower. But who would not? There's such a beautiful orchid to come out of that. So right here you got a rather uh, restricted range eucalyptus. This is eucalyptus the versicolor, aka the cowrie tree, and it only grows roughly around Boren up in southwest Australia, uh, over to Walpole, and then uh, over to Albany. So it's a, a rather narrow a geographic distribution. It likes to grow on these loamy soils laying atop limestone. You can see it does get big as hell. Uh, it's a rather beautiful tree, sheds its bark in autumn, and uh, uh, the leaves, of course, have a different shade of green on each side. It's uh, called being discolorous. You can see, uh, oh, they're starting to get some calla lily invasion over there. Isn't that nice? Regardless, look at that forest. You know, it's rather impressive. A lot of this shit was logged, but uh, just a little bit was left. Kind of like the California redwoods. They don't get quite as tall as the redwoods. They top out at about, looks like 130 feet, probably. But overall, a very impressive tree. Just look at that bark, too. That bark is, that's beautiful. And I guess it works, it does work pretty good for lumber tree, too. It's a good lumber tree. Relatively rot resistant. Oh, I just, oh no, he's done. Okay. Anyway, there you go. Kari trees, K-A-R-R-I, eucalyptus diversicolor. So look at that, a nice Kari forest, eucalyptus diversicolor. Uh, with an understory of Teridium esculentum, that bracken fern, big uh, big red stems on that bastard, pretty widespread throughout Australia, and of course, Agonis flexuosa. Here's that bracken fern, Teridium esculentum, pretty wiry, not delicate, certainly kind of stiff. You get slapped around with that, that might hurt a little bit, pretty uh, pretty hard, you know, pretty sclerophyllous. And then over here, you got a tree pea, Hovia elliptica. How fabacious are you feeling right now? You feeling pretty fabacious? I'm feeling very fabacious. Holy shit, I've seen so many goddamn members of this family. Variations on a theme. These get up to, you know, about 9, 10 feet tall. Oh, you get just the slightest intumentum on that abaxial surface. What a beautiful plant. What a beautiful forest. Oh, so look, you got a whole forest composed of uh, eucalyptus, the versicolor, hovea, elliptica, and teridium esculentum, the main constituents of this forest. Okay, so as you can see walking through this Carimbia forest, uh, all the trees are fire scarred up to about eight feet tall. You can see fire is a regular part of this ecosystem. Uh, it's inevitable it's going to happen. So rather than spend all the money and time like we do in California coming in here to thin the forest, quote, rake and clean it, uh, as uh, the pig Cheeto said, and all that, uh, et cetera, and what this shit, they just actually uh, let it burn. They do, uh, you know, a series of low-burning wildfires, and if it doesn't happen for a few years, they'll prescribe it and do it themselves. So, uh, you yeah, know, I'm not sure what the interval is, probably once every 10 or 15 years, depending on how uh, quickly the brush builds up and accumulates. Looks like it might actually need one now. But the point is, there's no stopping it. Think of all the money we waste in California, you know, sending guys in to thin to cut with chainsaws and whatever the shit, and then of course haul all that shit out or have prescribed burning piles, etc. It seems a lot easier to just let the fire do it for you. Do it late in the season, you know, uh, go in right before the rains start in, in the northern hemisphere fall, and uh, just, uh, you know, do a prescribed burn, uh, let it... Uh, let it just take care of all that for you. Much less man hours, much less money, much more cost effective. Or maybe, you know, if you live in an area that's been burning every 20 or 30 years for the past, you know, 500,000 years, maybe you don't build a McMansion there. Anyway, that fire must have happened a, uh, pretty recently. Because uh, here's a Podocarpus droinianus, which is a uh, conifer in a Podocarpaceae. And this, uh, this appear to be male cones. Is a conifer in a podocarpaceae that's only fertile the first year after fire. It doesn't get that big. It's a woody, uh, more like a woody shrub, only gets up about, I don't know, 10, 11 feet tall. But uh, it's a true podocarp. Look at that beautiful foliage. 
super waxy. Waxy foliage with those white stomato bands, those white bands of stomato wax underneath. Photocarps are pretty incredible. You know, they're not entirely Southern Hemisphere, but they're mostly Southern Hemisphere. Certainly, uh, they don't get much farther north than the equator. You know, you get the, uh, you get Matute, Podocarpus Matute in Mexico. But it's, it's again, like Protea, it's an old lineage. However, this is a conifer. It's not a flowering plant. They uh, technically got an arrow. It's a, it's still a, considered a cone. It's a, a naked seed, but a, a gymnosperm, but it's a, a conifer. So Podocarpaceae is the family. Podocarpus droinianus. Get up close. Get a nice money shot of that full frontal. Nice dong shot right there. Oh, that's beautiful. www.dongshots.com www.podocarpusdongshots.com I should be more specific. You can have that. That's not copyrighted. Look at all that pollen just coming off there. Resprouting from the base after a fire, after uh, after the shoots burn. Got a handful of ferns coming up. Uh, to, oh yeah, there's, see, there's more to Podocarpus. I wonder if I'll see a tiger snake. Probably at some point, I would love that. You know, preferably not gnawing on my hand, not sinking its fangs into my hand being that they're one of the most venomous snakes in the world, but preferably from a good distance, like six or seven feet. It might be nice. You know, I like snakes. A lot of Australians seem to like their snakes too. You know, they're, they got a pretty uh, respectful attitude towards them. They don't try and kill them, you know? Kind of makes me mad when you see meatheads talking about killing rattlesnakes. They really get off on it. I think a lot of it's just male posturing, you know? Those obsolete male impulses just getting to them. You know, people got to just kill shit. See, nice 80 anthem. Nice maiden hair. Yeah, there you go. More of that 80 anthem. Then you got a nice drawstring coming up, too. Yeah, it looks like this was just burned recently. Probably last year. And all these must be fire sprouters. You can, you know they gotta love the fire at least a little bit, right? To a little extent. Wonder how they feel about condo arson. You guys fans of condo arson? Uninhabited condos, of course, you know? The ones that are under development and just move to a poor neighborhood. And then of course drive up rental prices for everybody else that lives there. Wonder if they're fans of condo arson, you never know. You know, some people, some people come out of the closet. Some people are big fans. Certainly a lot of people in Oakland. Ah, oh, just dozens upon dozens of little pygmy sundews everywhere. Anyway, so there's a recently burned woodland. You can see everything seems to be recovering fine. This is, uh, you know, stuff will just die back to the roots. And then uh, you get the xanthorias. Of course, the outer outer leaves burn on them, but the inner ones are fine. It's regenerating. The corymbias are fine. The eucalypts are fine. Pretty pretty cool to see, and it just clears everything out. Leaves more exposure. You know, it overall leads to a healthier woodland. You know, low burning wildfires instead of repressing it for 40 years and then having massive ones. Is that Thoria looks nice? You know, it looks nice when it gets a haircut. Hey, you look dapper. Oh, he's a little mushroom that popped up, huh? He was just picking, I put him on his side to go look at his, uh, yeah, put him back, to look at his skills. Just like a big bald head, look at that, you know? He's shaving a wax. It's like he's just popped up on a burn. What if he responds to fire? I wonder how the fungi respond to fire here. Probably pretty good. A lot of them are probably adapted to it as well. This might have been mean of me, but I just had to do it. These big sandy mounds appear to hold, uh, Hundreds of thousands of termites in them. <laughs> Fuck. Are those termites or could they be ants? I don't know. But you see, you see them everywhere. What, what do you expect? You know, you get some prick like me. I just, I'm not a, I'm just curious, you know. Anyway, here you, here you go. Here's, so you normally think of Proteaceae as uh, large shrubs or trees, but here's a, here's a relatively small one. Still woody, of course, but uh, this is Grevillea cursifolia. With a 
wonderful climbing drosera on it too. You can see that about I don't know, three and a half feet off the ground. You can see what I call a cursifolia, the oak leaf gravelia. Proteaceae. Just another goddamn beautiful uh, proteoid. You know, I just, I'm so obsessed with this goddamn family now. They're really incredible. I wish we got them in the northern hemisphere. You can see them in gardens and shit. I don't think any are too invasive. You get a couple in gardens, but uh, they're just out of context. I mean, here they really belong on the sandies. At least these species really belong on the sandy, phosphorus-deprived soils of of uh, Western Australia. God damn it. Look at that. And then, of course, I mean, even the leaves are just... The leaves on these bastards are something else, too. These, how you guys doing, huh? You guys can rebuild that, you know? The, that's not going to take you too long, is it? I'm sorry. I won't do that again. I was just curious. Oh, uh, look at that. Just a giant uh, iron-rich rock. Just, Jesus Christ. It's... <laughs> God, it's like 20 pounds right there. Oh, at least. It's like one of those kettlebells. It's, feels like the weight of a 20-pound kettlebell. Anyway, here's another one. Johnsonia. This is in the genus Johnsonia asphotilaceae. Quite beautiful. And I believe that's Asparagales, the asparagus order. You know, the world's a premier monocot order. Again, these get quite large. You can see them coming up from a basal rosette. This is a relatively small one. They're quite pretty, huh? Oh, look at that. And then even... Hiding in the bracts right there, you got the actual, uh, the actual flowers. Look at that. Again, quite gorgeous, but it just looks like a, you know, a juncus or some weird blade of grass, you know, without the flowers on it. And then, of course, just on everything is that the uh, climbing drosera. There's so many different droseras. I'm not even going to try to key this out because I'm not an expert in the family. But uh, it's just, you know, doesn't need much structural support because it's scanned into other plants. It just kind of climbs up other plants. Look at Johnsonia again. Oh, here we go. Back in a jar of forest. Ah, nice rubbish pile over there. Anyway, variations on a theme. Proteaceae, the proteoid lifestyle. Slap me around with everything proteaceous. Here's a petrophily. It's a species of petrophily. Uh, maybe linearis or... Diversal life, forget, I forget. I was just reading about these. But anyway, get up close. You can see it's pretty late in the game. It's The flowers are almost done. It's got white flowers, white peoples when it's going off. You know, and like uh, most of the proteaceous uh, bastards, nothing uh, kind about this foliage. Somewhat stiff, somewhat hard. Those prominent styles are, of course, uh, they all look like they're in the female phase. It's like, I, like I said, this is late in the game. Remember, they present the pollen first and then go into the female phase later. But, uh, you know, a beautiful plant, like everything. I, I love the goddamn proteoids. This is my gateway drug, the proteaceae. Anyway, there you go. Protrophiles, that genus. Looks like petrophile. More of that drosera. And then here's that Grevillea cursifolia again. An exceptionally showy specimen. This fucker looks good. Look at that. Okay, see, there you, there you go. Those teeples haven't opened yet. So those flowers are closed, even though, you know, they're so prominently uh, exerted, they look like they're already in the flowering stage, but they're not. Those, uh, remember, those teeples will peel back and uh, release the style. So this thing isn't even blooming yet, technically, and it's still gorgeous as hell. So contrast that nice pink flower with this uh, very sharp and abrasive foliage. Actually, it's very glabrous and smooth, but the uh, the margins are certainly serrated. Look, it's like a fucking saw. Revealia cursifolia. Okay, there we go. Another uh, fabacious bastard right here. Bossiea ornata. Look at those sessile flowers, relatively stiff leaves. Somewhat lanceolate. And eh, not linear enough to be lanceolate. They're white. They're much wider at the base. But uh, either way, you got a nice uh, yellow outer banner, red inner banner. You can't really go by a lot of the, the flowers here. You have to look at other traits. Does the flower have a petiole or not? Is it sessile? All the uh, papillinaceous Faboidiae flowers look the same. Remember that Faboidiae subfamily? There's just so much goddamn diversity here. Bossier or not a... You know what? I'll give a... Uh, I'll sign a free t-shirt. 
a cr free crime pays t-shirt to anybody that can get a proper key for uh, the Fabacier of uh, Southwest Australia. You know, not even a proper key, a proper key. And then do me a write up of what the, are the key morphological differences between uh, Fabaceae of Southwest Australia. Fuck it, do all of Australia. Uh, you know, what morphological aspects to pay attention to in determining what species, what separates one genus uh, from another genus, etc. Anyway, that's enough of that. Here we go. Another, uh, another wonderful case of convergent evolution. I kind of already showed you this already. However, here's a wonderful uh, comparison between the two. Two species that look the same, but they're not even in the same family, and they're not even in the same order. On the left, you got a species of Kingia. I believe it's Kingia australis. That's a Poganaceae, and if you get up close, you can almost see the leftover uh, inflorescences on them. Oh, yeah, maybe maybe a little bit. See right there? It's got kind of those dash of Pogon-looking flowers. And then you look down here, and you got Xanthoria, probably Priceii, P-R-E-I-S-S-I-I. You know, they're doing the same thing, both looking like a grass tree. However, uh, Kingy, of course, doesn't branch. You know, and it's got a, you could tell them apart, actually. Once you've stared at them long enough, see the Xanthoria is much wider, the Kingy is much narrower, taller, narrower, slender, more slender, both fire resistant, both extremely long lived. That's probably a 300 year old uh, individual right there, at least. These are reported to grow very, very slowly. I believe they both do, but Kingy's probably grow slower. Just hanging out in the Jara forest, that relatively open canopy, fire dependent forest, fire adapted forest, and what the shit. Proteaceae, Myrtaceae. Hey, you've heard it all before. Maybe I can shut the fuck up. Regardless, what a goddamn beautiful, look at that. Convergent evolution at its finest. No relation, just uh, adapting the same habit. Works for him. Oh, uh, so back on the lateritic soils and the iron rich soils. And it seems like uh, it's mostly Carimbia around here. There was a, you know, Jara, Eucalyptus uh, marginata around. It's a much bigger tree. Pretty impressive tree here. But here we have another variation on a theme. This is Pimalea suaviolens. Real suave. Smells absolutely delightful. And up until now, most of the Pimaleas we've seen have been a little pink bastards. They're cute. They appreciate them, whatever. This one is actually a lot taller. It smells incredible. Very pungent flowers. You know, almost smells kind of like a gardenia. And it just, it's just kind of like, look at that weird growth form. No leaves until about five inches before the flowers start. And of course, you just got those bracts holding that inflorescence together, those yellow bracts. Those are not petals, those are bracts holding a cluster of flowers, holding a, a compound flower, i.e. the inflorescence. You know, so Pimaleas Pimala and, of course, Thymeliaceae, that's a family I had never even heard about until I got down here and started seeing it everywhere. Pimaleas, is a very prominent genus down here. Many different species in Pimalea. Oh, God damn it. That's... Hey, and Isolation Nauti again, Gudiniaceae, sister clad to the Asteraceae. Look at this uh, little cup fungus right there. What's going on with these, huh? How do you think they're interacting with those plants? It's a little close, huh? Not a parasite. What if they're ben benefiting him at all? Hey, who knows? Hey, it's another one of those low-growing prostrate banksias. I'm always impressed with the proteoids, how they're, the color of their foliage contrasts so uh, pleasantly with the, the flowers. It's a dead flower, too. I mean, not dead, but it's just done. Actually, no, maybe it's still going off. Just finishing up. More at the Conostylus again. Massive, <laughs> just massive fucking ant mounds. So here we go. Here's two new genera of Proteaceae that we haven't seen yet. Here's Adenanthos. Look at that guy. Hard to believe it's a proteoid. Doesn't get very big. Got a woody stem coming up from a uh, little tuber down there. Here's another proteoid. No idea which one that is. She's just a little bush, fragrant flowers. Almost look like cones on there. Do you like that? I like that. That's pretty nice. There you go on a female face. Actually, it's hard to tell if they're in a female face or not. 
Are they presenting pollen? Are they presenting or are they receptive? The flowers here are sessile too, so it's kind of hard to key it out. There's another species uh, that I've seen. It's got the uh, long petioles. The, so the flowers are on a stalk, a little branch, but these are not. These are rather sessile. And, and it is, a, you know, it is a woody and hard foliage, you know, <laughs> spiky. You know, just if you were to squeeze this and give it a hug, it would hurt a little bit. It, it does. Nice better into herbivory. Another wonderful proteoid growing in the bush with the flies and the mosquitoes and the tiger snakes and the brown snakes. And eh, I'm just kidding. It's fine here. It's nice. Look at all that xanthoria. Nice family of xanthoria there. Degenerates. You know, you got 12 species of Proteaceae growing just in this little area that I've just been botanizing for the past, I don't know, what, 15 minutes? Here's another one. This one's pretty interesting. This one just finished up flowering. You can see those are all the dry styles on there still. And those, of course, uh, on many of the Proteaceae, the, uh, those styles hold on. You know, they, they kind of stay on. The individual florets stay on, and they serve as further incendiary to uh, help ignite this cone, this fruit, rather, this infructescence, and get it to open. You can see they look like little clams. Uh, they open with heat or with fire and then release all the seeds inside. So, and a lot of proteas do that. At least a lot of banksias do. They will hold on to those, uh, and I believe this might be a species of banksia, but a lot of those, ban the banksias at least, will hold on to those florets again. And it, it just, you know, in case the fire isn't, is it hot enough or just goes through really quick? This kind of just aids it for it, it basically adds more fuel to ensure that it does get hot enough, that infructescence does get hot enough to uh, open up all those seeds and dump the seeds out. So, again, fire adaptation in the Proteaceae in Southwest Australia is true to roof. You know, it's just, it's, it's everywhere. So many different genera, so many different species have the same thing going on. There it is. They're adapted to fire. So the cones need fire uh, to open and release the seeds. And then probably the seeds need a little bit of smoke treatment, uh, the actual chemicals and smoke to germinate. Uh, so back in a jar of forested sunset, oh, these are all eucalyptus marginatus. You can see they got plenty of burn scars. Fires are regular here. A nice macro a nice psychic in the background. You know, here's a weird one. This is a Logania vaginalis in the Loganiaceae, which is a family that's entirely endemic to uh, New Zealand and Australia. Got opposite leaves, pretty fragrant flowers. Oh, super fragrant flowers. That's nice. And then this one over here, this is actually, this is a pretty weird one. Remember, the, I guess it's an Ericaceae now. It used to be in a Packardaceae, which is like the southern hemisphere uh, blueberries, the southern hemisphere heaths. This is Leucopogon verticillatus. It almost looks like a grass, doesn't it? It almost looks like some sort of weird fucking bamboo or something, but no. Look at those leaves. Beautiful. Look at the venation on those. Quite impressive. They get up here, look at the flowers. Verticillatus, because it's got leaves, obviously, that the uh, verticillate, they kind of occur in a whirl around the stem. Flowers seem to as well. So just these little spikes uh, full of uh, dozens of tiny flowers. And again, this was uh, the uh, artist formerly known as Apacridaceae was the family, the Southern Hemisphere Heaths. You can tell it's, this is a lineage that has been separated from the Northern Hemisphere area, KCA, for a very long time. You know, likely acid-loving as well, likely heavily mycorrhizal. Oh, there's more of that Johnsonia. These haven't opened yet. So when they do, remember, in between those bracts are the flowers. There's Photolacea, another wonderful monocot right there. Oh, God, it's jarring here. No pun intended. The botany's just crazy. There's that Hovea again. Hovea elliptica. Anyway, it reminds me of the time. You know, I was a student brakeman 15 years ago. I remember I, I was, uh, you know, it took me two years to learn railroading. It takes anybody two years. It's, you know, your ass is all over the place. The company's filling your head with crazy shit, and then it's just kind of tricky to learn how to use these 10,000 ton pieces of machinery that could uh, 
basically flatten you into a penny. So at one point I was it was in a crew room and I was sitting there with the engineer, uh, crusty old bastard. I uh, used to enjoy all those guys. They were very uh, unpleasant to be around at first, but they kind of grew on you. Anyway, at some point uh, during uh, during our time together, getting our paperwork together, he just looks at me. I asked a question. I asked a stupid question. He just looks at me and he says, Jesus, you're all fucked up, aren't you? And, uh, indeed, I was. I had no idea what I was doing. I was uh, <laughs> completely fucked up. And it's kind of how I feel uh, right here. That's why I keep making jokes about being on cough syrup because it just, it's just such new florida meat such new families genera species etc and such new ecology too so anyway that's all i got for you tonight hope you have a lovely evening and uh, uh go fuck yourself you know i almost hit you you know that's not very nice what are you doing in the middle of the road you know i almost knocked you over i'm sorry Okay, you all right? What are you doing? Oh, you got some big ass eyes. Oh, you're a, you're a weird looking one. What are you doing? Once you get out, at least now you're not in the road, okay? You can't hang out in the middle of the road like that. All right? Oh, wow, you're gorgeous. Oh look at you! Look at those big orange eyes. You look like a you look like a walking Halloween decoration. Why are you looking at me like that? I'm I'm skeptical of you. <laughs>